This program is possible in part by a grant from the City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department. On Life and Times tonight, the issue has created a virtual civil war in the county. Should El Toro Marine Air Corps Station become a landing strip for communists? There are plenty of reasonable people on both sides, and then there are some folks that I've dealt with that um, you know, have made death threats and will call and, and use a lot of profanity when they're talking to you. Death threats? Absolutely, and it's to the point where, uh, I mean, one woman during the flight demonstration called up and said she was going to blow up the runways. Also, their roots stretch back to ancient Japan, but this is one group of performers with a thoroughly modern pedigree. Zendeko has performed before some impressive audiences, including the Emperor and Empress of Japan, Pope John Paul II, Nelson Mandela, and former President George Bush. These stories coming up next on Life and Times Tonight for Thursday, June 17th, 1999. Life and Times Tonight is made possible by the following corporations and foundations. The James Irvine Foundation, which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizenry. GTE, a company committed to telecommunications excellence and an open dialogue among all people. Bank of America. Did you find the perfect home today? What if you did? How can Bank of America help make it yours? Bank of America, put your life in motion. And the L.K. Whittier Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life by supporting innovative endeavors in the fields of medicine, health, science, and education. Good evening, I'm Kathleen Sullivan. Tonight we focus on one of the bitterest political debates in recent Southern California history. The dispute is over whether El Toro Marine Base should be turned into an international airport. Would it bring an economic boom to Orange County or bring the area's cherished quality of life crashing down? As Saul Gonzalez learned, it all depends on who you ask. The Marines have a reputation for relishing a good fight. But here in South Orange County, they're fleeing a battlefield. The conflict is over what to do with El Toro Marine Corps Air Station after the military pulls out. For many people, the choice is obvious. Turn these 4,700 acres of tarmac, hangars, and open space into a crossroads of the world, an international airport called OCX. I tell you, it is tailor-made to be an airport. Ellen Call is with the El Toro program an Orange County agency formed to increase public support for an international airport. It has been a military airport for over 50 years. So we have the, exist the existing airfield, which we can make great use of. We don't have to just build an airport from scratch, which would add to the cost just enormously. When fully operational, OCX would serve 28 million passengers a year. That's about half the number of people who currently fly in and out of Los Angeles International. Supporters argue a new international airport is essential to keep up with Southern California's future air travel demands. OCX, they also claim, would help ensure Orange County's prosperity well into the 21st century, creating over 90,000 jobs and generating $560 million a year in tax revenues. This airport would be a tremendous economic engine for Orange County. And uh, there's a lot of talk about the wonderful quality of life that we enjoy in, in Orange County, and it's very true. But what a lot of people forget when times are good as they are now is that one of the chief components of quality of life is your economic health of your community. And we need to have better air service in this community so that we can prosper economically over the next 20 years. I don't see that the argument has any validity. First of all, we're the fastest growing economy in the state of California right now, Orange County. We don't have an international airport. Like many elected officials in South Orange County, Irvine City Councilman Mike Ward is vehemently opposed to an international airport in his city's backyard. He argues suburbs and 747s 
just don't mix. What we have here is a Marine Corps air station that is moving out of the area because they say that the encroachment of the community around the Marine base made it very difficult for them to operate. So the county and their infinite wisdom now are going to take and put a 28 million passenger a year international airport in the same area, which is surrounded by residential commercial uh, development. Local residents fear noise and traffic generated by a new airport would cost them far more than just peace and quiet. What it would do is it affect their property values. You know, if you can't drive to work because you have clogged freeways and clogged arterials, people don't want to move into this area, so the demand for the property drops. If, uh, if you have bad air pollution, property drops. If you have uh, pollution, property values drop. Two weeks ago, airport supporters tried to soothe concerns about one major issue, noise pollution, by staging a series of test landings and takeoffs. The idea was to show that proposed flight paths for commercial jets wouldn't disturb nearby residents. Critics claim the tests backfired. It woke a lot of people up. A lot of people who didn't think they'd be affected by the airport realized that they were sitting outside by their pool or sitting out on the patio having a barbecue and a 767 went by and the noise level was so high that they couldn't hear themselves talk. As an alternative to an airport, OCX critics proposed turning El Toro into a giant residential, arts and industrial development. It's called the Millennium Plan. Airport supporters say there's one thing wrong with the idea. The, the biggest problem with the Millennium Plan, number one, is that it does not include an airport, which is an obvious thing to say, but the airport is, is what Orange County needs the most in terms of infrastructure. The controversy over whether to turn this sprawling facility into an international airport once the Marine Corps leaves has become one of the most divisive issues in Orange County history. More than a dry debate over noise levels and traffic, it's become a kind of civil war, pitting one part of Orange County against the other. Well, it has divided the county. It has divided the county between north and south. Uh, and I don't know if the county will ever recover from it. There are plenty of reasonable people on both sides. And then there are some folks that I've dealt with that, um, you know, have made death threats and will call and, and use a lot of profanity when they're talking to you. Death threats? Absolutely. And it's to the point where, uh, I mean, one woman during the flight demonstration called up and said she was going to blow up the runways. Combatants on both sides of the airport conflict are prepared for a long struggle. I have a 25-year-old daughter, and I honestly believe that if it is going to become an airport, she'll be a grandmother before that happens. She'll be flying out to and she's see not, the grandchildren. And she's not married, so we got, we got a ways to go. OCX supporters predict victory and promise that the first civilian passenger jets could take off from these runways as soon as 2005. I'm Saul Gonzalez for Life and Times Tonight. And joining us now are Tristan Krogius, who represents taxpayers for responsible planning. That is a citizens group opposed to putting an airport at El Toro. And also with us is Robert Poole, who is the founder and president of the Reason Foundation, which is a public policy think tank which supports the use of El Toro for commercial aviation. Welcome both of you to Life and Times tonight. First, let's get a timetable if we can. I think it's confusing. The base is going to close on July 2nd, one way or another, correct? Right. And then what happens? That's the big issue. Now, it, does it just sit there until anyone figures out what to do, or is it handed over to Orange County in a year? Uh, it's handed over to Orange County, but nobody really has a timetable yet, uh, because there's a whole bunch of steps that uh, still have to be defined as to whether it is going to be an airport or not, and that would require a huge environmental impact statement and uh, a lot of other decisions of that sort. Funded by Orange County? Funded by Orange County. All right. Is there an annexation effort that could go underway by Irvine before that time? Or is that a natural transition? Yes, that can proceed uh, during the interim, but uh, the, uh, the base has to be turned over with what's called a record of decision from Washington after they complete a, the Navy Department completes an environmental impact statement. And that has to come on the heels of the county's environmental impact report. And those have all been challenged in court. And the new, there's a new supplemental EIR, a new plan du jour on the part of the county. And, and that'll be challenged. And so we don't know what the timetable is. What what this means, it gives us plenty of time to debate whether it should or shouldn't be an airport. <laughs> well, we're looking at years. Yes. Years yes. and years away. Isn't this the most important decision that Orange County has ever had to make? I think this is really crucial for the future of Orange County. Here you have basically the, uh, the California's second Silicon Valley, and uh, it's growing tremendously now. 
but uh, already 96% of all its cargo, uh, air cargo, comes in and out of airports other than those in Orange County because there's just no room. 40% uh, of the people who, have, who fly, fly to LAX or Ontario or someplace, and that's only, those figures are going to go much higher in years to come, unless there's a new airport in Orange County. Just when a woman in Saul's piece did say it is the quality of life issue, but it bases two things, your economic quality of life versus your air and your pollution. I mean, how do you get a tally on how people feel after the other day's test? I know that uh, your group was very vocal, about 600 people, but is that 600 really representative of Orange County? So how do you get an accurate test of the people who were affected the other day? We, we've done an awful lot of polling, and there have been a lot of surveys over the past years. And uh, uh, most of them now show that there's a 60% preference for non-aviation use of El Toro over a uh, right, now, uh, aviation what use. What is that based on? That's based on uh, uh, polling data, by? based on research data by a newspaper, research data by the Orange University of California. Yes, and, and research data by our own polling. All right, objective polling that you would agree with as far as its objective, objectivity? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think people uh, uh, aren't playing with uh, a full set of information. Uh, when, I thought you were going to say a full deck. <laughs> a full deck. <laughs> uh, no, they really, they aren't looking at what the impact is of 20 years uh, of, of basically uh, starving Orange County of the transportation access that it's going to need in order to continue to have a viable, vibrant economy. All right, let's talk about, uh, there apparently was an issue in the past year um, where John Wayne International had to kind of accept extend its improvement uh, loans, I guess, or to say you know, the contract for the year. And it was included in that, that there would be improvements kind of quietly to El Toro. Is that, is that too far reaching that John Wayne has gone too far and assumes that it will be in charge of El Toro and that there will be a base and there will be improvements? Or is that a protect, protective measure? Well, I don't know exactly what you refer to, but there were some contracts that were let for runway improvement. They tried to sneak in some kind of project in on uh, El Toro, but they were caught by Supervisor Spitzer in the process, and he uh, manages to uncover most of this kind of shenanigans. But isn't that good to protect, at least get that money put aside just in case this, this comes up, that you should be prepared? Orange County certainly should be preparing uh, for you know either eventuality at this point in time certainly and uh, the pro the problem that I keep coming back to is that uh, uh, L John Wayne is simply I mean it's basically maxed out already not in terms of what it physically could do but in terms of the agreement that was reached back in the 1980s an environmental agreement that said you're going to cap it at uh, I think it's 8.6 million mm -hmm. annual passengers and uh, it's bumping up right up against that now. You're an expert at privatization yes. of airports. Yes. Um, would this be, it's confusing to me, would this be a private airport? Would it be Not, sold off? It would be that, run remains to be, that remains to be seen. One of the options that was included in Measure A that the voters approved some three or four years ago was a privately owned but it's not required to be that way. Uh, there are several precedents for developing a new airport of this type uh, using private funds and probably doing it more quickly than, uh, than would be done in a traditional government way. Tristan, as an opponent of the airport, who do you think benefits most by an airport being there, the Irvine Company? Well, I think the Irvine Company benefits. I think the other special interests benefit, perhaps such as uh, Disneyland or uh, Knott's Berry Farm may benefit. Uh, but. Uh, the people that don't benefit are the residents of, uh, of Orange County because Orange County is almost maxed out now in its development and these 4,500 acres represent almost half of the only remaining developable land in Orange County. Right, but there's an April study that says with non-aviation, all right, and, and, and other interests, you're still going to have more traffic, but you're going to have fewer jobs. Exactly. And then the alternative is with without the airport i mean with the airport you're you're going to um, not have as much housing i mean th these are very difficult issues they are. how they're, do you they're, plan they're 20 years ahead here. Uh, and i think if you look at it just from an environmental standpoint um, if if people in if the growth in population and the growth in cargo in orange county all has to be accommodated outside Orange County. You're talking about millions of truck trips and millions of car trips every year added to the freeways that are taking long distance trips uh, out of Orange County instead of relatively short trips to and from an airport that's right there in the midst of Orange County. The biggest single problem we have is that there's no unemployment to speak of in Orange County and we're importing labor from the Inland Empire and we have three airports in the Inland Empire so that are crying 
uh, that are crying for business so that we can create an economic base in the Inland Empire. And here we're trying to shoehorn an airport into Orange County uh, to the exclusion of the uh, growth of the economy in, in the Inland Empire. It makes absolutely no economic sense. Ontario Airport is already under a, an annual flight activity cap for environmental reasons. They really can't expand much beyond what they're already carrying. The state is kind of trying to supersede this. Should this just go straight to a vote right away on, on, on the next possible measure? Well, it uh, in a sense will be going to a vote in March of 2000 and, uh, in the primary election because mm -hmm. there's right now a ballot initiative called the Safe and Healthy Communities Initiative which would call for a, two, uh, a vote of the people in order to approve any expansion or new airport. And, it closes and it, that means no expansion of John Wayne and no new airport either. And Tristan, thank you so much. And it closes down July 2nd with no known future. Tristan Krogius from the Taxpayers for Responsible Planning. Thank you, Robert Poole, also of the Reason Foundation. Thank you both. And if you would like to continue this discussion about El Toro with other viewers, we invite you to visit our internet chat room. Go to the KCET website at the address on your screen now and click on the icon for Life and Times tonight and then follow the instructions to enter the chat room. And up next, the drums of the ancient samurai resound through downtown LA. Take one part Zen meditation and one part noise, mix with equal amounts of rhythm and inspiration, and you get the ancient tradition known as Taiko. Now, these fantastic Japanese drums are a familiar sight at festivals and holiday performances, but few people know about the history and the artistry behind the performance. Taiko is sometimes called the heartbeat of Japanese culture. Gay Yi now introduces us to a new generation of taiko drummers who are perfecting their art in the heart of downtown LA. Through taiko, I can really express my feeling, my pride of my Japanese American culture, my background, my heritage. Taiko gives me um, self confidence. I learned discipline and a lot of self confidence. I'm sure all the other kids you know, have the same experience where it's like a completely different world once they step into the world of Taiko. It was once used on the battlefield to scare the enemy or signal the troops, to conduct religious ceremonies and dispel evil spirits, for communication between villages or to celebrate the harvest. Now, Taiko drumming is considered a performing art popular around the world. In fact, the traditional taiko is far more popular now than ever before. In the heart of Little Tokyo at Senshuji Temple, a group of youth spend their Friday evenings rehearsing for upcoming performances. Vivian Seki is the group's instructor. But you really have to make this a part of the movements, okay? It's here, and don, suku, don, don, suku, don. Miyagi is supposed to be a very sharp piece, not just a... The group, Senshuji okay. Zendeko, it, was formed in 1986. They were initially it's trained by an internationally acclaimed taiko group from it's Japan. Me. The group Ondigoza, a famous Japanese taiko group um, from Japan, came to Los Angeles to tour. And they trained with us for approximately a year. We went through some vigorous training, and um, we decided to form a performing arts group. And um, from that time forward, we have just um, trained new generations of kids coming in. You guys are small, but you have to give the image that you're big, OK? Five, six, seven, eight, go one, Zendeko two, has three, been described four, as one of the five, premier five, performing five, arts groups in the United States. Members endure strict practices, and all of the students learn to play a variety of instruments. Students in our group learn all the different um, drums. We have small drums, which are shime. We have medium drums, which we call chudaiko. And we have a large drum, which is called the odaiko. And we also have wind instruments. We have a shakuhachi, which is a long wind instrument. And we have a shinobue, which is a flute, a bamboo flute.
Zen meditation is an important part of training. That's where the students learn focus and concentration. We incorporate that into our drumming by having the individual concentrate on their breathing. Um, breathing and also the rhythm, nothing else. They tell you to focus beyond the wall. Through most of history, only men played taiko. Even as late as the 1950s, women were not allowed to hit the drum, not even allowed to watch men practice. But that's changed. Some people believe it's because of taiko's popularity among Japanese Americans. In Japan, these types of traditional arts were actually diminishing. Uh, the young people didn't really want to explore the old traditions of Japan. Um, the Japanese-American taiko groups actually play a role in bringing back the traditional arts to Japan. There are about 150 taiko groups in North America. Most groups don't receive any funding. To save money, they make their own drums using wine barrels. This cost-saving design has helped inspire the growth of taiko in this country. However, Senshuji Zendeko has been fortunate through donations and money they earned from performances, they now boast of owning the traditional type of drum made from one piece of wood. Our instruments are made out of a Japanese oak, and it's made out of the entire trunk of a tree, which is, which is prepared by cutting down the tree. They hollow out the inside of the tree, and uh, they attach the skin, which is um, cow skin. Zendeko has performed before some impressive audiences, including the Emperor and Empress of Japan, Pope John Paul II, Nelson Mandela, and former President George Bush. They also perform several times a year here in Los Angeles at community events and festivals. The performance that I have done, it's, it's really great seeing people's faces when they, they, when they just enjoy it. It's, it's really special. They see a whole different side of me. When they see me do this taiko, they're like, wow, you know, you, know, you have strength and you have power. One of the main reasons students join Senjuji Zendeko is to bring them closer to their own Japanese heritage. I've learned more about my culture, not just about the drumming, um, but we go and perform at different events. It kind of brings us closer to the Japanese community. I learn a lot of Japanese traditions. It teaches me a lot about my culture. I have so much fun. From the youngest taiko drummer to the oldest, each will continue their Japanese tradition and share their culture, their music, and their art with the world. In this day and age, Culture is a way of, of extending yourself to other people. And I believe Taiko really does that. It really touches people in a way that most other things have a hard time doing. All of those things mean so much to me. And Taiko has given me all of that. Beautiful music and beautiful pictures. If you'd like to find out where you can see and hear these at Deco Taiko, you can call the group at this number, 213-624-0463. That's 213-624-0463. Or you can actually visit their website on your screen right now. Well, today is the first of the torturous test called the U.S. Open. Golfers worldwide sympathize with the conditions imposed by the U.S. governing body called the USGA, and this year the prison conditions are at Pinehurst No. 2, a Donald Ross course where three par fours are of the longest ever in U.S. Open history. And while the rough is low, the greens are hideously contoured and force even the greatest shots to roll off the greens. Hence, why most of the Open contendants today wore striped shirts. Even the officials had stripes on. It's a prison, Pinehurst number two, but some have been given parole, like Mr. 59, David Duval, who last week burned his thumb and forefinger on a teapot. And he proved today that to hit a great shot, you only need three fingers on the club. He at the top of the leaderboard then includes three others, Phil Mickelson, the Southpaw, the Short Game, Billy Mayfair, and Paul Guidos, an alternate math teacher 
from here in Long Beach. Well, they all survived. Tiger Woods got caught in a trap twice. John Daly birdied the first four greens, but then he stumbled. And even the man who's played bridesmaids most at the Open, four times Payne Stewart, he bogeyed the last two holes. All those and two others are two under on a leaderboard full of the greatest in golf. An interesting note, by the way, there are more than 15 courses at Pinehurst, but only one good bar. The field will find the playing even tougher when the conditions are this dry. Well, that is our program for tonight. Hugh, Pat, and Kerman will be here tomorrow for their weekly roundup of all the news that is fit to fight about. And now for everyone here at Life and Times tonight, have a great evening. Life and Times Tonight was made possible by the following corporations and foundations. The James Irvine Foundation, which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizenry. GTE, a company committed to telecommunications excellence and an open dialogue among all people. Bank of America, did you find the perfect home today? What if How can America help make it yours? Bank of America, put your life in motion. And the L.K. Whittier Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life by supporting innovative endeavors in the fields of medicine, health, science, and education. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department.